Buonasera, good evening. Thank you for attending. I'm Valeria Rumori, the director of the Italian Cultural Institute in Los Angeles. It is a true pleasure to have an audience tuned in from North America to celebrate Italian Research Day. During this past year, the Italian Cultural Institute in Los Angeles and the institutes throughout the world have been presenting an engaging cultural program online through webinars, exclusive videos, language programming. Today, we are delighted to host the webinar Language, Mind, and Brain, a conversation with Professor Massimo Piattelli Palmarini of Arizona State University, moderated by Professor Martin Monti of UCLA. With opening remarks by the Consul General of Italy in Los Angeles, Silvia Chiave, and Cinzia Zuffada, Jet Propulsion Laboratory Associate Chief, Chief Scientist, and also President of the Italian Scientists and Scholars in North America Foundation, ISNA, and also recipient on this very special occasion of the 2021 Italian Cultural Institute of Los Angeles Creativity Award for Science, representing Italian excellence in science. This event has been organized by the Italian Cultural Institute in Los Angeles with the Consulate General of Italy in Los Angeles and ISNAF in coordination with the Embassy of Italy in Washington, DC. I would like to thank the Consulate General of Italy in Los Angeles, ISNAF, as well as, of course, today's distinguished speakers, Professor Massimo Piattelli Palmarini and Professor Martin Monti. Your invaluable collaboration and contributions are truly appreciated. This evening's program will begin with welcoming remarks from Consul General of Italy in Los Angeles, Silvia Chiave, followed by ISNAF President Cinzia Zuffada, and then followed by the discussion with Professors Massimo Piattelli Palmarini and Professor Martin Monti. We then invite our public to ask questions using the Q&A chat tool in Zoom found at the bottom of your screens. And now, without any further ado, I'm very pleased to present the Consul General of Italy in Los Angeles, Silvia Chiave. Consul General, the screen is yours. Good evening and welcome to the fourth edition of the Italian Research Day in the World organized globally to celebrate and to promote the contribution of Italian scientists, scholars and researchers to science and progress. The day chosen for this worldwide celebration is the 15th of April, the day uh, when Leonardo da Vinci, who needs no introduction, was born. Uh, this day was also created to thank our scientists uh, abroad and to let them know that Italy cares about them and that we attribute a very a great value to their to their job. Uh, now science and research are in fact very important tools of promotion of our strategy of promotion and Italians abroad that work into the field of science are important ambassadors of this let's say less known excellency that Italy is so proud of. Now our researchers abroad are more than 30,000 and half of this number is in the United States. It's all people that greatly help us to maintain a fertile and continuous dialogue with this country and in this area and to develop joint projects to expand the frontier of knowledge and render the world ultimately a better place. Now think only about this pandemic. In this pandemic uh, the uh, scientists never stopped working together besides what politics um, did uh, in the meanwhile. So uh, only to say that science has a great unity that goes beyond borders. That's why we strongly favor and support the work of ISNAF. ISNAF is the Italian scientists and scholars in North America Foundation that organized uh, this webinar with us uh, as part of the series We Are ISNAF. Today we will also honor uh, ISNAF's president Cinzia Zuffada, our great friend uh, and associate uh, chief scientist of NASA's JPL with the uh, Italian Cultural Institute Los Angeles Creativity Award. Congratulations, Cinzia, you are a great asset for Italy in this area. Uh, now, coming to today's event, Language, Mind and Brain, 
I want to warmly thank uh, Professor Massimo Piattelli Palmerini, uh, one of Italy's most important scientists in the US for uh, adhering to this invitation, accepting this invitation and for sharing with us some of the fruit of, the, of, his, of his studies. Professor Piattelli Palmarini is also one of the founders of ISNAF, so thank you. I want to also thank uh, Professor M Martin Monti of UCLA for participating to this inspiring conversation. And now, with no further delay, I want to leave the floor to Cinzia Zuffada. My dear friend, Cinzia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Director Rumori and Consul General Chiave for this awesome introduction. I'm humbled and honored by the distinction that the uh, IIC in Los Angeles has given me with the 2021 Creativity Award. And also I'm grateful for hosting this uh, hashtag we are ISNAF webinar on the day that celebrates Italian research in the world. With the support of the Italian Embassy, ISNAV started this series to feature prominent experts in their fields, widely distributed on the North America territory, who also serve in leading roles in the ISNAV organization through a collaboration with the Consular Network and the Italian Cultural Institutes. Tonight, uh, we share with the public the work of Professor Massimo Piattelli Palmarini, one of the original founders of ISNAF, and also its first vice president for a long time. To engage him in conversation is Martin Monti, professor in the Department of Psychology and Neurosurgery at the University of California in Los Angeles. His work is focused on two of the most characterizing aspects of the human mind, uh, the relationship between our language and our thoughts, and also what is the consciousness and how it is lost and recovered after severe brain injury. Dr. Monti's work uh, has been featured in some of the best academic journals and also popular media. We are really thankful to Martin Monti for coming and being with us tonight. And now, without any further ado, I give the floor to Professor Monti to properly introduce uh, Massimo and start this engaging conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cinzia. Thank you very much, Consul General, Director, uh, for inviting me uh, to be part uh, of this evening. It's a real pleasure, and it's a, it's a real pleasure and honor to introduce uh, uh, Massimo Piatelli Palmarini, um, who started his academic career in physics, uh, being awarded a doctorate from the University of Rome, uh, to then work at the Institut Pasteur in Paris under the directorship of the Nobel Prize awardee Jacques Monod. Uh, he then, however, shifted his attention towards cognitive neurosciences and linguistics, which will be the topic of tonight, um, starting uh, his work at MIT. And as was being mentioned by Cinzia just a moment ago, in 1974, um, Massimo, together with his colleague and, and, and the longtime collaborator now, Noam Chomsky, inaugurated um, the beginning of the field of biolinguistics. And this is a, a still ongoing and very fertile collaboration. Um, Massimo and Noam have, have written many uh, books and, and uh, have written books and uh, many articles together and certainly contributed in many ways uh, to the field. And you should know that beyond his uh, um, scientific, strictly scientific output, uh, um, Massimo is also a very, uh, a very well acknowledged um, uh, writer of popular books. That, that bring to the public in a very understandable way some sometimes very technical topics. Currently professor of linguistics and cognitive science at the University of Arizona, Massimo is working now on a very ambitious project, trying to create a real physics of language integrating quantum field theory and generative grammar. Massimo, welcome to tonight. But maybe tonight, rather than talking about physics, maybe we can talk about chemistry. We can talk about the ingredients of language. And I would like to start from the words of your collaborator, Noam Chomsky. Once trying to explain 
how deeply intertwined language is with the human mind and how what a deep aspect of, 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 of us language is. He once said, something has to account for the fact that my granddaughter picked out a part of her environment as being language related and just developed language and suddenly could, could speak. Whereas her pet kitten, or maybe a chimp or a songbird, even if they heard exactly the same language than his granddaughter did, they would never learn anything about it. Why is language so tightly attached and so tightly intertwined with the human brain? Well, thank you for this question. And thank you all, I mean, you know, for hosting me. After these presentations, you're going all to be disappointed, you know, it's beautiful, fantastic presentations. So uh, the question is, you know, exposed in a sense to the same input, you know, Chomsky's granddaughter and the dog, you know, but there's the difference, you know, language is part of human nature. We are the only species that has language. I'm ready to, you know, defend this thesis with data. Some, you know, don't like this idea that we are the only species, they stress, you know, other species having a little bit of language and all that. We may want to go into that a bit later on. So um, it's part of our nature. And so Chomsky likes to say the following, that you know we don't like the word learning, we like the word acquisition. So the acquisition of his or her mother language by the child is not something that the child does, is something that happens to him or her, something that happens to him or her. Language grows in the child. And the role of external linguistic input, you know, again, Chomsky says is like watering a plant. The external, you know, input language is essential, is essential, of course. You grow up in a community that speaks English, you get English, a community speaks Arabic, you get Arabic and so on and so forth but language grows inside the child. So it's not learning the way we learn other things. You know, we go to the university, we learn stuff. It's not learning, it's acquisition, it's part of the nature of the human species to acquire language. So this is the fundamental difference. We are born to acquire language, other species aren't. You know, Massimo, the way uh, you speak about language and, and the way, of course, uh, Noam speaks about language, it often feels as like many other aspects um, of our brain. You know, think of seeing. For a normally sighted person, we just, we don't really learn to see what is in front of us. It just, it just happens to us. It just, it's just an embedded part um, of our neural system. And see, this I find often very surprising um, that our ability to develop language seems to be fairly unrelated from, you know, just generally how smart somebody is or, you know, how intellectual somebody might be. We, we all seem to be able to develop regardless of other aspects of our mind, of, of a perfectly uh, fully formed and understandable and, and perfectly uh, legitimate representation of language in our mind. What, what do you think this tells us about you know, the relationship between language and other aspects of our mind and our brain? Well, you know, language is, you know, a module. In fact, it is a constellation of modules. So it interacts with other parts of the mind. So for instance, you know, you have syntax. Syntax is really the core of language, you know, and over the years, over 60 years, in generative grammar, you know, uh, we have been approximating what is called universal grammar, UG, what all languages have in common at a very, very deep level, you know, they have in common at a very deep level. But of course, then we use it to communicate. This is what we are doing right now. We use it all the time to communicate. And so you have pragmatics, you have the use of language. And in the use of language, <clears throat> you presuppose things you have a situation, you know, an environmental situation. So you presuppose that, you know, the hearers, you know, are acquainted with the general situation. So you have this different component. They can be studied, you know, uh, in so one 
separately from the other, luckily, otherwise it would be too complicated. So you mentioned, you know, the creation of this whole field biolinguistic. Of course, language can be approached in many, many different ways, you know, literature, poetry, social linguistics, difference in use of language in the different groups, and so on and so forth. But in biolinguistics, you know, we are interested in the biological foundation of language. Syntax particularly, but not just syntax. So, you know, to answer your question, yes, you know, uh, some individual, human individuals, are very, very, very smart, incredibly smart, great mathematicians, you know, great scientists. Others, you know, are more sort of normal, they do ordinary works. But as far as language is concerned, we are all the same. Some can have a richer lexicon, a greater vocabulary uh, than others, more specialized vocabularies and all that, but that's practically the only difference. Otherwise, our intuitions, our intuition of what is a good sentence of Italian and what is a bad sentence of Italian, that's uniform. It doesn't depend on degree of intelligence. You know, it depends on our knowledge of language, your tacit knowledge of language. You know, Massimo, this, this also makes me wonder about an, another aspect. So you just said that, um, language is a part of us, it's a part of our brain. It comes presumably encoded in our DNA, no different than all other aspects um, of our brain. Um, and what is so surprising often to notice is that as you said, we all develop um, a fairly equal representation and understanding um, of, the of our linguistic environment. And yet as children, it's undeniable that we are all exposed to very different environments. I mean, one child could be born to a family um, where the child is always talked to and, 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 and is, you know, is, is given a lot of attention and is spoken towards. But in other families, and in fact, in, in some cultures, the, the way in which we, we don't quite talk to the same extent towards children, maybe we don't correct them much to, to help them acquire language. How is it that children who grow up in, in such different, you know, uh, cultural, socioeconomic, and, and many other aspects in such different environments, yet still end up knowing the same language. I mean, you and I, and, 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 our, and our audience right here, we all grew up in, in a different predicament. How did we all get to the same understanding of language? Because the core of it, the deep core of it is common you know, to all human beings, you know, all human beings have this core, you know, it's called an error syntax technically, or universal grammar. So this core is common. And then, of course, you know, in different families, you know, they hear different sentences, not to mention different languages, but, you know, let's take one language, you know, Italian. Growing up in a family where the Italian is spoken, even if different families in Italy, you know, aside from dialectal you know, dialects, you know, they each child hears different sentences in different times, but the core is the same. The core is the same. And moreover, you, you know, pronounce a thing that uh, I want to say something about. You say correction. No parent, no parent corrects the child. It's such a miracle that the child speaks. So parents, you know, or caretakers, they correct the children when they say something false, when they say something disrespectful, you know, sometimes in words, you know, they, you know, you don't say, no, this is not the right term, this is not a, a stivale, this is a scarpa, this is a boot, not, not um, a, 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 a shoe, not a boot, and this sort of thing, but otherwise they never ever correct. Moreover, over the years, there has been evidence that even when a parent corrects, tries to correct the child, the child is insensitive to correction. And if you really insist, you know, in a number of cases, my friend and colleague, Tom Beber, with whom I've been teaching this course already twice with no, uh, Noam Chomsky, Tom Beber, and myself have taught the course. So Tom Beber has a nice examples in which the child says, no, 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 
I say this, you say that. So the correction doesn't go through. There are no corrections, no correction, except as I say, something disrespectful, something that is false, mm -hmm. this sort of thing, but there are no corrections. So this is why it, it, it is, you know, a fantastic thing, you know, I'm not trying to trivialize it, you know, it is fantastic to see how language grows in the child. You know, in different families, hearing different sentences in different situations, but the core is the same. Okay, I have to, I have to press you on this, Massimo. The core is the same, how is it possible? I mean, what does Italian share with, with Chinese? How, how, I mean, children come into this world and they, in principle, you, can, you could take a, um, an infant and they could learn any language, right? All over the world, children learn languages that are so different from each other. I mean, I can't think of many things that are similar between English and Chinese. How is it possible that there's a common core? Well, look, it was a discovery. It took decades to identify. Uh, but just to give a very simple, very simple example, so you have nouns in all languages, you have adjectives, you have you know, verbs, different kinds of verbs that you have. You also have a dominant order, you know? So you have subject, verb, object. In some language, you have object, subject, verb in other languages, that's uniform. But the variations are minimal. So there is technically what we call parameters. So there are principles of syntax, principles. But the difference between the different languages is on the one hand, the lexicon, you know, the lexicon is different, you have to learn. The morphology is different, you have to learn. But once you have learned that, there are few points of variation and those are called parameter, parametric differences. And so each point of variation is such that you only have two possibilities. You know, we model as plus or minus. So just to give a very simple example, Italian is such, it is called a prodrop language. You can omit the pronouns. So you say, ho mangiato bene. You can say that in English, have eaten well. You say, I have eaten well. You also eat. French is the same as English in this respect, non prodrop. So you have this little difference with a lot of consequences. So the child comes into this world, okay? He or she has to acquire the lexicon and the sounds, the morphology. But then, you know, really the main task is to position, you know, each of these parameters, you know, let's say approximately 30 such parameters. In this language, you know, implicitly she understands this is plus in this language, in another language is minus, and so on and so forth. So this explains the paradox that you have a universal predisposition to language. You have a universal grammar, <laughs> but still you have thousands of different languages. So you have to go deep, deep into the analysis to see what is common. And over the decades, one has been going deep into the analysis, isolating these points of variation, discrete points of variation called parameters. Each parameter is ideally having only two positions. And there are what are called signature sentences. So they are sentences characteristic of the value of that parameter in that language. And the child is predisposed to pay attention to these signature sentences and therefore positions the parameter in the local language in the way it should be positioned. So Massimo, so if I'm, a, if, I'm a, if I'm an infant, then my problem in terms of trying to develop a language with, after all, I don't know how many, how many sentences do children hear in their first two, two, three years of language, but how many ever sentences they hear that is sufficient for them to develop a fully formed language. So, so you're saying that I, I don't really need to form all the grammatical structures. I just need to set in my mind certain parameters. I just need to understand if in my language, I can drop a subject or not. I, I can not say who the subject is. So is this a better sort of picture yes. of what, what does it mean to acquire a language? Yes, yes. because look, uh, 
Robert, <coughs> sorry, my voice, Bob Berwick at MIT has made the following calculation. So take in a case of a language that has 100 rules, syntactic rules 100. And imagine that the child you know, hears a new kind of sentence every second, really idealized. He made the calculation. You know, if, you know, the idea is the child has to tweak these hundred rules in different ways, it will take centuries for the child mm -hmm. to acquire. So it cannot be that, nothing like that. Here we have a different approach. You know, as you correctly mentioned, you know, you have to, to position the thing. So very, very simple example. In Italian, you say piove, nevica. In English, you cannot say rains, snows. You have it rains, it snows. In French too, il neige, il pleut. So Italian is called small pro drop language. You can omit things. And what is extraordinary is something like the following. So you have it rains, but it doesn't snow. Okay, it rains, but it doesn't snow. And then you have, it rains, but it doesn't matter. Now the second it is not the same as the first it, because mm -hmm. it does not matter, it's the fact that it rains. So it rains, but it doesn't snow, the two it are the same, they refer to the atmospheric agent. It rains, but it doesn't snow, the second it refers to the fact that it rains. In Italian, you don't hear those. So you have piove, ma non nevica, piove, ma non importa. So two silent things are understood by the child. Two silent things that are not pronounced. One refers to atmospheric agent, the other refers to the fact that it rains. You know, so this is really what is called poverty of the stimulus. You know, how can you teach? You don't teach a child this sort of thing. You know, the child understands, you know, passively these things because he or she comes into this world predisposition to understand these things. Massimo, um, let me pause on, on, the, on this thread of conversation uh, because somebody asked a question that is very interesting and, and I really welcome more questions through the Q&A um, function um, uh, to make this a little bit more interactive. Somebody asks your take on uh, on a very important question in, in cognitive science. And they ask it a little bit technically, maybe I'll repeat it a little bit less technically, but they say, is Professor Piatelli Palmarini pro Piaget or pro Vygotsky? And what they mean as, as, as the questioner uh, further elaborates, is it that language comes first and that allows us to develop all these other wonderful things that the human mind is able to do, maybe mathematics and music and all these incredible things that we do, or do thoughts originate language? Do you have well, a take on that? Yes, I have a take on that. You, you and I have been teaching Piaget and Vygotsky and Chomsky and these things, you, I know you. So no, I am not a Piagetian, you know, there was, I organized, you know, years ago, the debate between Chomsky and Piaget. At the time, I was sort of indifferent. I, was, I went there. And then, you know, Chomsky totally persuaded me versus Piaget. So there are different rates of maturation of different cognitive capacity. So vision develops immediately, hours, hours after birth. And then you have other things that take more time to develop. Some develop more slowly, then you have language develops and other things that develop. So they interact, but you know, there is a lot of modularity. There is a lot of modularity. There is a central processor. You know, the central, we do science and mathematics, you know, with the central processor. But then for a number of other things, you know, there are modules and these modules interact, but they are separate. So I don't have to tell you that specific brain regions specific brain regions are responsible for specific cognitive things, including language, different components of language. You have different kinds of loss of speech, loss of language called aphasias. So there is a lot of modularity. I think one of the main discoveries of cognitive science 
in the past 50 years or so is the modularity of brain and mind. This really, you know, is the new thing, the important thing, the modularity of brain and mind. So if you were born in a different country, it was exactly the same life and exactly the same circumstance and exact, and you could study the exact same thing and do your exact same scientific career, but you did all of it in Hindi or some other language. Would you have been the same? Well, you know, you and I have been teaching also this thing. So this goes under the technical name of the Sapir Wolf hypothesis. So the idea, of course, you know, different cultures have different values, different styles of life, and so on and so on, different beliefs, religious otherwise. But the question is, do they think differently? Now, some, you know, are the opinion that, you know, there are differences in thinking, in basic thinking. Others like you and I, you know, say, no, basic thinking is the same. It is not dictated by in the language you speak. So, you know, there have a number of data, you know, about this. Um, so, um, for instance, famous case, the Tenehapan Mayans, you know, they do the following thing. So the classic test, you know, I have slides, but I won't go to the slides. So you have a table in front of you with objects on that table. And then you have a table behind you, which is empty. You have a basket with those objects. You ask the subject to reproduce the same in the table behind. So if you reproduce the same with respect to your body, what was on your right and the table in front will be on your right and the table back. If you reproduce the same with respect to the outside world, if this was on your right, it will still be it would be on the left in, in the, in the back. Mm -hmm. So the idea that experiments were well done that Tenehapan Mayans, they don't have in their language, allegedly, don't have in their language words for right and left. So they do it with respect to the world. You say in English, in other language, you have right and left. So you do it with respect to your body. Well, Lila Gleitman, you know, did a very fine experiment. Perfectly monolingual English speaker students at the U University of Pennsylvania, they were tested with this thing in a closed room in which there were no references, you know. And then another group, strictly monolingual, you know, students of the University of Pennsylvania, they were tested outside on a terrace overlooking the campus. And a number of them behaved like the, the Mayans. You know, they were asked to do the same, you know, outside on a terrace overlooking the camp. So this is one of the several experiments that say, you know, the language we speak contra the hypothesis of Sapir and War doesn't condition the way we think and the way we exploit the task. There are many differences, you know, among different groups, many differences in style of life, beliefs, you know, habits and things, but not basic thinking. Well, as you know, I agree a lot with you. Uh, let, me, let me keep asking you some questions because we're getting some very, very interesting questions. Um, now, one particularly interesting question, which I think everyone can relate to, is the following. A child can acquire three languages at the same time. And right, there's many examples of children who grow up um, bi or trilingual or more. But, but for an adult, right, we could spend uh, several years in a different country and never quite master the local language in that same way that we master languages the way we do when we are young. Yes. Why? Well, in this is biolinguistic. <laughs> it's a biological phenomenon. So look, you know, for instance, you know, between the age approximately two years old and let's say it's eight years old, every child in the world, you know, acquires one new word every hour, one new word every hour. You and I, you know, I am too old, but even you were younger. We couldn't do that. We couldn't learn a new language, you know, uh, you know, learning 12, 13 new words every day, every day, every day, every day. No, impossible. 
the biologists did. There is a maturation, the brain matures. There is a different maturation in the brain. And so this explained the difference. So accent, you know, you, you and I you know, are fluent in English, but we have an accent. You know, uh, if you, you know, had acquired English when you were age two or three, or, you know, uh, you wouldn't have a, an accent. And moreover, you know, what a child, you know, trilingual child, you know, many children are trilingual, you know, uh, when you are older, you know, it takes a long time to learn a language. You never learn it perfectly because your brain, you know, is different. And also you have these mentioned parameters. A number of parameters are frozen in our mind, brain and mind, frozen from your native language, including phonological parameters. Phonological parameters are frozen. Why we have an accent, you know, and make mm -hmm. several kinds of mistakes. So it is a quintessential biological phenomenon, neurobiological phenomenon. So as our brain changes, just our ability to acquire new languages changes unavoidably. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, if you don't mind, I would like to keep asking you questions from, from our audience because we are getting um, uh, more and more and, and extremely interesting uh, questions. And, and if you are writing a question and we don't get to it, I apologize. It's just that there is a large number of questions coming in. Um, so one particular interesting question, and I know uh, this is a topic that interests you a lot, uh, but somebody says um, that, so the human brain is, is the acquired, is, is wired to acquire language, uh, but 200,000 years ago, so at, at the dawn uh, of Homo sapiens, uh, of course, no language was spoken. Um, and so the question is, did, did the did the specific wiring for language develop at the same time as some kind of initial uh, proto-language? Um, or, or, or did one develop first, uh, presumably, I'm guessing that the wiring, and did it then get repurposed or did it then get through, did it then start serving a different role in language? Well, of course, this is a very hard question to, to, to answer. So, you know, there have been a number of publications. You know, the Neo-Darwinians, you know, they, they, they are continuists. You know, they insist that you go from animal communication progressively, richer and richer animal communication to language. No, but you know, we are the only species that has language. So we are discontinuous. Something happened about 100,000, 150,000 years ago, a rewiring of our brain and there are some ideas, you know, how that rewiring operated. I have a couple of slides for reasons of time. I don't know if I can project them. So the idea is that it happened, you know, some mutation, probably more than one single point mutation happened then. And then our progenitors, you know, had everything they needed for language, you know, this capacity of forming hierarchical structure, you know, with, you know, hierarchy, and recursion and all that. And then since they have this capacity, then, you know, they develop, you know, the interface with sound, with communicating that. So the capacity to articulate was probably there already. And also the essentials of conceptual, you know, thinking, basic, basic thinking was there already. What the language did, the interfaces, with on the one hand the conceptual part and the other hand the articulatory part. And, and, and then you have language. It has been from the evolutionary point of view, you know, really, you know, a click of the eyes, you know, it was very, very rapid and very recent and very important. And of course, it, it must have been some small change that led to all these, given the time scale. Right, of yeah. language evolution, there must have been some small enough change that led to this revolution inside our mind. Okay, let me just, you know, it won't take that long. Let me share. Mm -hmm. Oops, wait a sec. Let me share a couple of figures. 
please. Okay. So I hope you can see this. Yes, we see your slide. You can you see the slide? From newborn to the adult. So pay attention to the regions in blue. Can you see that? Yeah, at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so this is, you know, uh, Daniela Perani, you know, and, and colleagues. So in the newborn, you see, you know, this is the left hemisphere, this is the right hemisphere. So look at the blue arrow. So the newborn, you know, lacks this region that the adult have in blue. So on the bottom you have blue and it lacks this region. So the acoustic is already there. The sensitivity to language acoustical is there, but there is no link that you have in the adult between regions of the brain, Broca's region and Pernicus region, you know, region that are characteristic. So also you have that in primates, that region, you know, is that loop doesn't exist in the primates. So something happened, you know, 150,000 years ago that don't, that loop was formed, you know, you form that loop when you have language. Now, this is a good hypothesis. I'm not telling this is the way it was. It's a good hypothesis. It's the best hypothesis we have so far. And it doesn't require that much, you know, it doesn't require a huge rewiring of the brain. It requires a local rewiring of the brain. Small changes, but big consequences. You know, speaking, speaking of, of wiring of the brain, yes. somebody asks a, a question that I think is very pertinent, of course, to the discussion we were having a moment ago about understanding um, how does language emerge and why, is it, why does it emerge the way it does in the human mind? And somebody asks, um, given that artificial neural networks have made so much progress in the last, in the last decade and sort of periodically every, uh, every so often, right, we get a big jump in our abilities to model things with complex, um, with complex networks. Um, has there been any, any, any progress that um, things such as ne artificial neural networks have allowed us to gain in terms of understanding of how how language works and how it might work um, Look, in so the I'm human sorry. brain. I'm sorry. Uh, many would disagree with me, but I agree with Chomsky and other, you know, intellect. No, it's very interesting. You know, <clears throat> these neural, <clears throat> neural networks can do plenty of things, more and more, more and more things, but they work totally differently. They are called neural nets, but they're totally different from real neurons. So for instance, you know, for reasons of time, let me just mention the discovery inside each neuron of the intense activity of microtubules. You know, neural nets, you know, they have points of contact between, you know, the different connections. They have no internal structure. Each of our neurons has a rich internal structure. Moreover, you know, for instance, you know, one of these highly celebrated neural nets doesn't know how to deal with the following sentence. What to do, very simple. What to do, doesn't know how to deal with what to do. Doesn't understand, doesn't process it. And there are other major, major mistakes that is doing. For instance, you know, difference between words that have capitalized, the initial letter is capitalized or not capitalized is interpreted differently. So they are smart machine, they are impressive machine. We all use them, we all use them. Fantastic engineering, but understanding how the mind works and understanding how language works from those machines is, I'm sorry, hopeless. I certainly agree that we are able to map things that are difficult to detect. But, but of course, whether we solve the problem in the same way as these neural networks, Right, that is the that is the heart of it. Yes, um, Massimo, let, let me circle back to to a point that we were we were making um, a, a moment ago uh, concerning the fact that, as you were saying, when we acquire language, um, 
the problem we're solving is that we're setting certain parameters, meaning our brain comes into this world expecting certain features, expecting the language we hear to either drop a subject or not, and sort of these kind of things. So does this mean that there are limits to what in principle somebody could learn? Is there a language that somebody would never learn as a mother tongue? You know, if I, if I spoke Fortran or C++ to my children, would they develop that from day one? Would they develop that as their natural language? And would they then pass it on to their children the same way that they would learn and pass on Italian or English or, or, or Japanese? Let me again share my screen. Wait a second, I hope, you know, I can answer that. So, can you see? Really? Yes, we see your slide in essence. Okay, so this is a fantastic experiment by Andrea Moro and collaborators. So in essence, uh, you have monolingual German speakers, monolingual German speakers from the former communist Germany. Why? Because they had never been to Italy. They had never watched Italian movies. They had never watched Italian TV. So the experiment is the following. They are exposed to real Italian versus impossible Italian. You'll see in a moment. So a language with rules that violate universal grammar. For instance, form a negation by sticking no after the third word in a sentence, a purely linear rule. No language is like that. Form the interrogative by inverting the word order of a sentence. No real language is like that, real, you know, natural language, systematically violate agreement, masculine and feminine. So what happens, you know, here you have an example. So they were exposed to real Italian, you know, mangio la pera, la pera in mangiata da Paolo, and then to impossible Italian. So Paolo mangia la no pera, no inserted after three words. Pera la mangia Paolo in negation is inverted word order. Una bambino, you know, violation of masculine and feminine. The interesting result is the following, that the archetypal brain region, Broca's area, archetypal brain region for syntax, you see it here. So as accuracy increases for possible rules, real rules of language of Italian, it increases the activity of Broca's area. While they are checking impossible rules, you know, the activity in Broca's area goes down. So other brain centers are activated, you know. So, you know, here you have, was tried for Italian, was also tried the identical results for Japanese. So we can, we human can learn, these are five sessions, a number of sentences like those in each session. So we can learn, they are learned. You know, and real Italian is the white dots. You know, they improve and improve up to 100%. And, you know, the, the black dots are real Italian. Here you have Japanese, curiously, unreal Japanese is learned a bit faster by this subject. Okay, so here you have the details. You know, this is, you have, you see Broca's area in three different brain sections, sagittal, axial, and corona. So different brain regions are activated. So we can learn, you know, Fortran. We can learn, you know, even a, an intelligent child could learn artificial language and, you know, uh, logical formalism. Can we can learn, but it's different. It's different. It's called language, but it's not like language. So the absence of linear dependent rules cannot be considered a mere historical accident or a cultural conventional fact. This fact correlates with the functional structure of the human brain, although we are still, you know, far from understanding. Now, jabberwocky. So jabberwocky, I'm sure most, you know, those are familiar. It was brillig and the slightly told the gyrant gimbal in the way. So Stanislas Dehan and collaborator and Bernard Fayet, they tried, you know, uh, for reasons of time. So they tried, you know, to subjects, you know, were exposed in functional MRI. They were exposed to language, to sentences, 
real sentences with more and more complicated syntax, they were exposed to Jabberwocky. Now, Jabberwocky, you know, is really, the words are invented, but still the syntax of Jabberwocky is correct. So what you see here, you know, you see, for instance, I don't know if you can see my pointer. So this region of the brain, you know, increases a lot because this is a logarithmic scale, increases a lot, both for Jabberwocky and real language. This other region of the brain increases both for Jabberwocky and real language. Not every region is like that. And here you have the correspondence, you know, for, you know, blue is Jabberwocky and here in red is real language. So to conclude this part, Errors activated by lists of words. So they had real words in, 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 sorry, real sentences in French, 12 words long. Then they had lists of 12 words and they had to learn this list of words. So brain activation was completely different. You know, what was activated was not Broca's area, was not the areas we have seen, but what was activated was memory and mental effort. In detail, for those who have some familiarity, you have a lot of familiarity with all this. The precuneus, the posterior cingulate, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, very important for decision-making, bilateral inferior parietal lobule. These were deactivated, let me insist, deactivated relative to rest and progressively deactivated more and more as syntactic load increased. So yes, we can learn these other things. They are called languages. We can learn this thing, but it's different, different brain activation than you know, Chinese, Italian, Spanish, you know, real languages. I hope this has somehow answered your question. You know, one thing that strikes me as I hear you portray this way, uh, these findings, is that it's not that somebody recognizes that something is not a language and says, oh, this is not a language. I need to do something else. Just as we read it, our brain without our conscious intervention knows that it's something different, really no different than if I, 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 I heard a sound or I saw something. It's just two different mechanisms. And it's not that I am deciding that something is a, is, a, is, a, is a sound or something is something that I look at. Just my brain just reacts differently. It's, it's part of yes. me. I can't do anything but be this way. Yes, yes. Well, you know, it's like we use the term, you know, image, you know, image or picture for very different things. So we use language. You know, there are those who speak of language of the flowers, you know, Ikebana, the language of flowers. You have the language of traffic, you know, you know. So language is, is a term used for all sorts of different things. But what we have seen and what we have to keep you know, in mind is that language, strictly language, you know, natural human languages, such as English, French, Japanese, and so on and so forth. And these other things also called languages, programming languages, logical languages, are different things you know, processed by our brain and mind differently. Um, Massimo, maybe I'll ask you a last question because we're, we're winding down and people have to go dinner or sleep depending where they are joining us from or, or maybe out to or work. Tea, or tea in the East Or Coast. tea. <laughs> um, and, and this is about what you just said, um, language versus communication, but, but it, it leads me to ask you about the difference I mean, obviously humans, we have language. That was the topic of what we've, this, we've been discussing. How about other species? I mean, there's a clear sense in which they're communicating. Is that any close? Could, you know, could, could, um, could a primate learn our language if just we gave them the right chance and we, told, we, we taught them the same way that we teach our children? Well, the answer is no. So the best case was Nim Chimsky you know, this male chimpanzee, you know, for four years, you know, he was sort of literally adopted by Laura Petito, who lived with Nim Chimsky, you know, in Upper Manhattan, in a, in a villa belonging to, you know, Columbia University. 
lived with Nim Chimsky for four years and every day, hour after hour after hour, tried to teach him sign language, you know, signs of American sign language. Okay, well, it was a big effort. So in the end, after four years, he managed you know, somehow to acquire 120 signs of American sign language. He, you know, combined two of them, sign minim, you know, eat nim, you know, drink nim, that was it. So um, in the end, you know, there was no syntax. He acquired this and no syntax, absolutely zero syntax. So the longest well-certified sentence is something like, me, nim, eat, me, nim, drink, nim, drink, me, drink, nim, drink, me. It's something like that. Is that not, you know, the beginning of language? You know, it's a different thing. So even very smart, very smart creatures like non-human primates, chimpanzees in particular, they are very smart, but they don't have whatever it takes you to really master language, not isolated or very simply combined you know, gestures. So we are the only species. Other species communicate. They communicate in many ways, you know, efficiently. They communicate, you know, you have hierarchies, you have you know, alpha males, alpha females, you know, all that stuff, you know, very complicated communication. And we use language to communicate, but our language is not shaped, is not shaped by communication whenever there is a contrast, a conflict between efficiency of communication and you know, efficiency of computation, syntactic computation, syntactic computation wins, always wins. Well, Massimo, thank you for this in in incredibly interesting uh, conversation. It has been a real pleasure. I, I thank everyone in our, in our audience, but I will, I will pass the floor to Director Rumori um, for a goodbye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, all those who asked questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Piatelli Palmarini, and thank you, Martin, for asking all these interesting questions. I think we would have, you know, we would need another event to go through, but it's been extremely inspiring. So we really appreciate it. And I've seen that, you know, there are still questions coming from our audience that maybe you can reply to later. So they are, welcome, once again, they are welcome to send me emails with those questions. Okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Professor. So thanks once again, Professor Piatelli Palmarini. Thank you, Martin Monti. And uh, thank you and congratulations again to Cinzia Zucfada for her Italian Cultural Institute Creativity Award today. And thank you all for joining us for this Italian Research Day. And we invite you to follow us on our social media and uh, visit our website and sign up for our monthly newsletter to receive updates regarding upcoming events. This year is also the 700th anniversary of the death of the father of the Italian language, Nante Alighieri, and the institutes and in Los Angeles with the other institutes in the United States are offering a very rich program of events, exhibits, screenings, and more. Please join us also on April 28th. We will be hosting a webinar as part of Dantum Film Series featuring the artist Sandal Burke and director Sean Meredith discussing their collaboration on their film, Inferno. We also currently have the virtual exhibit Dan Drawing Dante, Dante 700, available online on our website, featuring over 40 artists' interpretations of the Supreme Poet's iconic image, organized in collaboration with Dante Plus. Thank you all for attending this event with Italian Culture Thank Institute you. of Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. And where Italy comes to you, and have a wonderful evening, and buonasera a tutti. Grazie mille. <laughs>